So welcome to this session. I think we, we have a short uh, uh, introduction of the, the panelists for you. And then we have a kind of short uh, uh, introduction uh, uh, video. And then we shut down the screen so I can either see you with the things and then you have a discussion here and also with you. Because remember, there's a workshop today. So this is interactive, uh, uh, although it's a small audience, but still we have the uh, adult things. So <clears throat> I think, uh, I myself, I'm Ronald Stork. I'm the uh, CIO of the University of Groningen uh, in the Netherlands and uh, also involved in the, in the Dutch national uh, activities regarding public values and, and related stuff on there. And so maybe we can just go around. Good morning, my name is Magdalena Jansa. I'm um, G senior GDPR and IPR expert in Giant Association, which is, and I'm also based in the Netherlands. I'm Frank Kalicek, um, privacy activist, open source developer for a long, long time, and nowadays uh, CEO and founder of Nextcloud. I'm Mandora Hovica, I'm an assistant professor of uh, human rights law at the University of Groningen. Yeah, my name is uh, Oskar Stein. I'm um, also assistant professor at the Department of Governance Innovation Program Director of a uh, um, Bachelor for Data Science and Society. And Oscar, uh, uh, actually myself a little bit, but Oscar is special. Uh, uh, but we are, the two of us are driving a program in the University of Groningen that's called Data Autonomy. And I think that's a good introduction of today's session and, and uh, we even made a short video of it. So maybe we can show that as an introduction for today's workshop. As a student, can my student data be used to profile me when I apply for a job or an internship? As a teacher, I'm concerned can my students use ChatGTP to make their assignments with excellence without actually learning anything? Well, as a researcher, if I upload my research to Pure, who has access to this data, who gets compensated for this data, and who benefits from this data? As a staff member, when I report in sick, is the data shared with others? And how does that affect us in the future? One thing I would just like to... Data autonomy is about being able to make meaningful choices about our data. It is also about not having to be afraid of how your data could be used by platforms or cloud service providers. At the moment, we cannot be sure that our data is being used in our best interest. The control is in the hands of a few very powerful players who might use our data to increase their power to the detriment of our personal autonomy. Data that we put on the internet can be used in unexpected ways, without our knowledge or consent as the work of Belgian artist Dries de Porter shows. The big question for all of us now is, what is data autonomy? Dependency on big tech affects all of us, regardless of our individual roles. However, we imagine the desired independence, data autonomy, in various ways as individual concerns differ. With our initiative, we strive to understand the needs of the University of Groningen's diverse community. The University of Groningen wants to become more data autonomous. Therefore, we have started a project which consists of three phases. Drawing up a roadmap, initiating a pilot project, and finally implementing the entire roadmap. We work together towards a definition of data autonomy that the University of Groningen wants to pursue, and a strategy to protect academic freedom in the digital age. You are part of this, whether you want it or not. The only thing you can decide upon is, are you going to act? Join us on the journey towards more data autonomy, here and now. Become part of the data autonomy community. Okay, again. As a student, can my student data... <laughs> Thanks. So, of course, this is really focused on, on University of Groningen, but for today, uh, of course, the same topic, but then, on a European level at the, at, at the minimum to start at the European level. So you are, uh, let's just do a short round, Magdalena, you are a European act, uh, uh, law active. So what is your thoughts on this uh, data autonomy and, and well, more broader, the, uh, the, the privacy of, of, of uh, related to, the, to education? Well, I think um, in privacy, I think transparency, transparency is like the biggest topic that is highlighted. And data autonomy is the, um, very much connected with the topic of data transparency, 
but I think it's not as visible to the people. Not uh, they are not as much as aware as they should. And I think, from especially from academic perspective, or even let's go broader to public institutions, I think we should be asking questions like, where is our data kept? Who has access and control over it? So, do you think it's a threat to the public values and academic freedom? I think it depends how it how it is used, yeah. and with good program and um, like the process of choosing cloud, which is aligned with our values, and we know um, we have all the contracts in place, we have defined the roles, then it's a little bit better. But I think if we don't have proper privacy and security programs in place, then definitely it can be. Um, detrimental to our, for our institutions. Okay. Detrimental, but Frank, so you are, what's your thoughts on, especially the, the threats to public, to public uh, institutions like academic? Yeah, I, I think it's very interesting because if you, if you do IT for a little bit longer, as I do, um, when you're old, then you remember that uh, IT and data and software was something that was not not political, not really interesting. It was done by some nerds in the basement um, but nowadays um, it's pretty clear that it's on the top of the mind of a lot of people it's like about like um, influencing elections or espionage or other other things it becomes like super important and, and, and political now and uh, you can also see this in uh, in um, movements like the open source movement which was at the beginning uh, only about like i don't know just a way to write software and licenses and other things again that were only interesting for some IT people and nowadays it's really um, become super important for um, countries for for Europe uh, for, uh, for for companies because it is all about data autonomy and being control of your data controlling privacy security and so on so um, to summarize it IT software data is no longer just a boring thing that comes out of the wall it's like super important for our society now and very, very political. So the, the, to, to put it differently, you say it's very important for society. So and today we focus on academia, but also yeah. important for academia, I guess. Yeah, yeah, of course. I know for that part of society. <laughs> 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 right, yeah. But, but is <laughs> yeah. it the, what is the current threat on, on the, for academia? For, I mean, I mean, whenever you handle data, and we all handle data, and it's the same for academia, you, you want to know where it is and who controls it. And if, for example, now with AI, if there's bias in it, for example, a very important thing, what are the, what are the effects on the CO2 footprint? It is all these very important society questions. And this is in academia absolutely the same. Um, and for that, we need to understand where the data is, what software is running, is doing, handling the data, um, to analyze it, to yeah, basically to control your data, to have data autonomy. And I think for academia, it's also super important. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, what I said earlier about AI, this is obvious, obviously a very important um, topic for the future, also for academia. And for that, being in control of the data, the training data in that case is like key. Yeah. Okay. Ando, so, so what's your thoughts on, on you're more from the legal perspective, you know? So what's your thoughts on the threats on academia for the, uh, with the current data? Uh, so, yeah, it's fine. Um, so it's very interesting, uh, first of all, the question of, and clearly we won't solve it here today, what are these public values that we aspire to? And that's where your project is uh, fascinating. Now, specifically uh, within the, the, the scheme of public institutions, academia has a very specific uh, place, right? It's a space that we learn how to think and how to express ourselves, both uh, members of staff and students. Um, so any kind of tools that we use online or any data that we give personal sensitive, uh, one may infer many, many, many things about individuals, but also about groups. Um, me, I was trying to think while I was, I was listening to the other speakers. So what is your position if you have a little bit of awareness of what's going on in terms of the threats and the risks, right? And I was trying to place myself like there is this huge power imbalance, right? 
when you have Microsoft or Google or other very big vendors and cloud providers uh, uh, giving us tools to use. And the university is somehow the proxy that I feel that I have a proxy for the, uh, as far as the university is concerned to safeguard specific data protection principles, specific human rights, and specific freedoms. So the question is, is the university actually safeguarding this? That's one. And the second, even if I'm, I'm a, the legal expert and we can discuss for hours about data protection principles and human rights issues and academic freedom, uh, for me the question is, to what extent do we really give agency to people and real choices? Yes, we may protect specific things, but what's really important is do we, do we have choices on the basis of technologies and specific technical measures to make these choices and to have our own agency exercise? And that's very important, I think. Yeah. Good questions. So maybe, uh, Oscar, you are yeah. really longer uh, active in the academic freedoms discussions. So what are your thoughts and threats on, on, on the academic freedom? Yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, what we are trying to do within the project is also to look at what, what are the different questions from different stakeholder groups. Yeah. And then when you look at it, for instance, at students, one of the, I think the biggest concern there is that they are increasingly living in an environment where everything that they are doing while they are learning is being measured and is being used to make projections about how they are possibly, you know, uh, behaving in the future or what they're interested in. And then it really comes with this question, so is, is there still a safe space to learn, to make mistakes, to, you know, how, how long does this data trail follow you? Um, then, of course, um, when you look at it more from a research side, um, I mean, we're often thinking about cloud storage and these types of things, and that's very obvious, but what, there is a lot of data being produced in the sense of either things which are being measured uh, by, by researchers who work more in natural sciences, but there is also um, the outcomes of the research which is then being uploaded to uh, platforms such as Pure in the Netherlands, for instance, which is run in the, by a very big publishing house, which then immediately gets all of the research outputs of those you know, different faculties, different universities. So you don't need to look at that from a personalized level, just following one or two researchers, but on an aggregated level, this has a lot of power, right? Because you can identify research trends very early, you can identify which types of topics are coming up. So there's also data broker side to this whole thing. And then finally, I mean, Frank has already mentioned this, um, when you think about uh, all of those wonderful systems which are coming up very uh, smart, you can call them artificial intelligence or it has been done or proposed yesterday, complex uh, uh, data management and, and processing uh, systems, then the question is often, so these systems need to be trained. Where does the data come from to train them? And I mean, in, in science and in academia in general, we have this trend to do more things open science, open, you know, make, make our things open and in a way that's very good for the type of impact uh, that we want to have with society. But it's not necessarily that this open knowledge and this open data is being used for good, right? So this can be used to train all kinds of algorithms, all kinds of, of systems in, in very unexpected ways. And then there is this question, and again, being, linking back to the values, um, what are we what are we doing uh, from that perspective if within the, and are we in the in a good space as an academic uh, community at that point in time yeah so threats all around so before we go into it uh, I, I really want to also discuss a little bit of the potential solutions and uh, Frank has a good solution <laughs> so, uh, but maybe some, the audience so do we have some some thoughts on threats on academia maybe uh, one of you can yeah you could but, but you, you use the microphone then no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because for the recording, right? So we can yeah. instead. Uh, well, yeah, I think honestly, I think I'm I'm thinking very much in the line of what Oscar just said about how students, yeah, feel they are, whether they're free kind of to express themselves freely to make mistakes as well. I think that's also a crucial part that learning is very much about making mistakes, and yeah. Well, um, and that, um, yeah, it should be somehow like education or education spaces should be a safe space, not only for yeah, achieving success, but also for, yeah. And I think quite often uh, this uh, right to be forgotten is also named in this context, that somehow there needs to be this right that data, that you have a certain control about which data sustains. Um, yeah, which I guess has also to do with the infrastructure and how much 
you can't even control data that has once been uploaded somewhere. Um, yeah. It's about, yeah. Yeah, so, so, but you're talking about safeguards, right? So I'm, I'm wondering, there is a, you can have a, a technical safeguards on, on the, or more the legal safeguards, I guess. So Frank, you, I think you're more on the technical thing. So can we manage this? I think a big, big part is um, to change the mindset of people and to create awareness around that. I think there are a lot of people on the internet, most of them probably, who think um, that the only way to write a mail is Gmail, or the only way to show your vacation photos to your friends and family is by uploading it to Apple or Google or something like that. Or the only way to write a thesis is with Microsoft Word or something. And especially for the, um, for the younger people who only know this cloud area nowadays where everything comes yeah, over the internet from somewhere else and you give the data, put it in there and it is then stored magically somewhere else. You don't even know who has access to it, what's happening there. Um, and most of it is paid then by advertising, of course, that your data is analyzed and mined. And so a lot of people only know this world. And for a lot of people, it's like not imaginable that you can, all the things you can do with keeping your data local or having it um, processed by an open source system where you can actually look into and see how it works and you can study it and you can improve it and you can make sure that there's no backdoor it um, and so on. So there is actually there are actually ways to have this differently from a technical perspective. But I'm a bit worried that a lot of people, especially the younger generation, only cannot imagine that. Everything comes from big tech and that's just how it is and it's somehow a rule of nature and there are no alternatives. And I think this is something we need to change from our awareness perspective. Yeah, I like the phrase that you said that the narrative, so we cannot do we cannot live without big tech. It's a dangerous narrative, right? So I, yeah. I like that phrase so that, that it goes it, it lives its own life more or less. Uh, and so maybe uh, Mando, you you say you you as I said before that we can also from with, with some uh, more yeah, so legal but more uh, administrative procedures uh, 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 change the the world as Frank describes. So can you say a little bit that? So, so with a procurement or you're getting so as as academia we can access we get away from the narrative that we have to go through uh, the big tech. So yes, so there, there, I mean, there are a series of legal and technical measures that, they're, if they're put in place, were supposed to be uh, much better. Let's just put it like this. Uh, certain of the legal measures have to do with how the individual. We can also find them in this, this, this DPR. How the individual, whether the individual, the data subject, has access to data. This, of course, is linked to transparency. So first, we need transparency. Whether the individual has is able to have access to this data whether the individual is able to exercise certain of the rights in the GDPR, for example, the so-called uh, uh, right to be forgotten. Um, uh, but it's, I mean, if from a legal point of view you try to track down and break down what we mean by the data is stored, the data is processed, we have in our minds that it's just one place somewhere very specific. But that's an illusion because data is everywhere. So if you try to, to break down and identify, okay, uh, through this huge complex of subcontractors, right, when we use cloud services, where is the data and what, who has what kind of obligations, this can be highly complex. Um, uh, I mean, for the record, uh, for sure, in a specific place in Germany, uh, in France, and in the Netherlands, for at least three to four years now, we have data protection authorities saying specifically for schools and universities, the tools that we're using to collaborate online, including Microsoft, Google, Amazon, are in huge violations of uh, privacy principles. But um, we're not really following up on this. Yeah. And this is hugely distressing because you have the authority saying, you cannot do this, but states and organizations, they don't follow up on this. Yes. Yeah. But back later, this may be also your area of expertise, right? So why is this? 
Well, I think um, just coming back to your question, um, I think legal side is not enough to uh, deal with those threats. And I think we need uh, contracts in place, but also we need uh, sec security programs. Um, and I think we need open source software awareness because that's the only, I think, alternative. But I think it's just much easier to buy a product that it comes with a support and you don't have to really understand how it works. You don't have to worry about technical setup. With open source, you have more freedom, but of course with this more freedom, there is bigger responsibility because you need to take decisions how this uh, how this will work, which data will be included, where the, uh, where the servers will be, and what technical uh, what technical skills in house you also need. Yeah. So, but what are then the 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 lay forwards? So, what are the kind of solutions if you say uh, so maybe approaches to overcome this? I think uh, to have in procurement or other um, other uh, processes that we are choosing um, the solutions, applications, that we will have our values reflected, that we will not only go for the good price, but also we will good for um, overall value that is uh, not only in the price for the product, but also like how the product is set up, etc. And I think from uh, what I have seen in, um, in procurement uh, with software, it's very often uh, the proprietary software, they have like bigger, um, they have more points than open source software because it's just more difficult to um, analyze the open source software. And also you need, to, if you uh, focus in the procurement on sustainability part, then of course like the choice uh, you will make will be closer with open source because the open source has amazing capability with sustainability. Yeah. Yeah. So, but Frank, you, I guess you have come through all the procurement things. So, what's your experience in that? Um, actually, I wanted to ask the same question that you asked earlier. <laughs> <laughs> because, like, um, there's lots of open source tools like Nextcloud, but also many others, which are actually relatively successful in the public sector. So, lots of governments seems to, and in Europe, seems to care about that. So, there's a lot of projects going on. And also at, um, in, in research, I mean, it's not perfect, but there's a lot of open source usage. But in the in the private sector, like in normal companies, it's for me this is mind blowing. I don't understand it myself because there's the GDPR and there's some legal requirements, and as we all know, privacy shield is dead. Um, and still, it seems to be possible for companies to just to ignore that. Um, so it's not it seems that the GDPR is not enforced enough. Yeah. Um, and that's something I personally don't understand why, how this is possible if the highest European court had a clear ruling and it's just ignored. I don't understand this myself. Yeah. So Oscar, you are more in, in that area, so what's... Can <laughs> you say a little bit on that? <laughs> 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 Not sure. Or at least Mark. Mark also knows about this court. Yeah. yeah the, Oscar first. Um, I mean, it's an ongoing discussion and also here there are several panels dealing with you know how to take this forward i think I, i'm actually really surprised and this is something which i think is also very important in the context of data autonomy that um how politically driven this discussion is right because i mean if you look at the whole saga of uh, eu us data transfers then we are doing this for around 20 years now um there is now the third uh, framework coming up where it's already clear that it's going to be challenged again by yeah uh, and, and, and then there's going to be another uh, decision by the court of justice and um it's very much driven by the momentum of the political quality of the collaboration between whoever is in charge in washington or in brussels right and and that and what i find then very difficult to square is then when you talk about privacy and data protection and all of these things which are which we perceive to be values in Europe and which are like part of public law and all of these things then it, yeah it is quite difficult to square that if it's such a high value and if it's you know is supposed to be standing for itself as a substantive concept how can this be so heavily affected by those political momentum shifts 
And, and that is also, when you then spin that further in the data autonomy discussion, a good um, uh, shows you that there is a power-based way to have these types of discussion and to approach these things. And then there is a value-based uh, approach. And also the conceptual work that I'm doing on data autonomy is very much emphasizing that value-based uh, perspective. So it's not so important you know, where a s service comes from. Uh, it, it's, it's rather important whether it's like Dutch or French or European and what it means to be European and so on. So it, it's much more important which type of values it embeds. And I know that in practice, this is not so easy, right? It's not so easy to um, divide those two aspects from each other, but you can always ask yourself, so where is the emphasis on? Is it that it is coming from here or from there? And it is, um, you know, um, promoting the interests of this particular set of people just because they're a tribe or because they are standing for something and dedicate what, something to what they're doing. Yeah. Okay, but maybe one of the others may on the legal aspect you want to add something or have some questions? Yeah, maybe I maybe have a question, but I don't know if you need to... If you please use the microphone, because the, you know we have a, a relatively small audience, people uh, that we are recording yeah, this, we get a really big audience on, uh, <laughs> online uh, later on, so... <laughs> uh, do you know the word for Amstading in... Uh, procurement? Procurement. Um, I'm working at uh, the University of Applied Science, um, Science Hogeschool Rotterdam, and... Uh, uh, we have a lot of problems with uh, procurement uh, because we can't ask many questions about uh, legal or technical um, solutions but some uh, because then nobody will uh, uh, sign in for procurement yeah so, so yeah, what it's a very relevant question for academia so you get applied science for universities as well uh, at least in the Netherlands, but I'm quite sure it's broader. Um, and well, we have some experts here on the table. So uh, maybe well, you said mm -hmm. it, but you're probably you're the expert on procurement, right? So <laughs> actually, no, no. Uh, expert just a little bit joking, uh, of course. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> uh, so it's a little bit likely. So, but the, yeah, yeah. given the concerns of this, of the high school, uh, uh, applied uh, uh, high school, the University of Applied Science in in, in Rotterdam. For me, in terms of the technology that we use and the choices that we're able to have, and hence later down that road, whether we have respect of privacy and human rights and specific freedoms and data autonomy, what we mean by that, the source of this goes down exactly to issues of procurement, right? That's why I was uh, earlier, I really want to ask um, uh, Magda a question like, do you think, and probably, you know, we, we need to have different criteria in terms in incorporated into procurement in terms of what kind of vendors and what kind of technology we want to use from sustainability criteria, yeah. like it was mentioned earlier, but also in terms of public valueness, like, um, okay, so what we want these technologies and these vendors to, to offer to us and what kind of safeguards, and this, this is very interesting, um, uh, although uh, uh, somehow expected, you see this disconnect between procurement and other services and there's no coordination about this, right? Um, and it's legal, but it's not just legal, it's administrative, right, this process. And in connection to this a little bit, like, I think that right now this whole conversation is not just legal. Um, it, it starts, we start to see this landscape evolving into specific best practices and standardization of specific uh, companies. For example, France, uh, one year uh, earlier, they impose for the first time the so-called trusted cloud label. The specific vendors need to be able to tick certain boxes, right? And you see immediately, you know, the big players, they jump immediately into this, like Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and they have to start, you know, their own trusted cloud principles and what does this mean exactly? Does it offer data autonomy? Um, so this kind of discussion will go down a lot in terms of not just a legal discussion, but procurement and ticking in terms of the process and administration specific boxes, I think. Okay. Uh, for the record, also very disappointing, the whole conversation about GEA and the European data spaces, right? And our willingness and the political willingness to try to promote non-European yeah. uh, yeah. European vendors and not promote uh, so much non-European vendors, so far is a disaster. 
because we see Microsoft, Google, they're in, and somehow they have been labeled as European partners in the data spaces. Remember, we are in Brussels, right? So Frank already challenged the European values in the, 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 the legislation. Now you are also doing the same thing. So interesting. But coming back to the procurement thing, Magdalena, the, the question from Rotterdam, what's your suggestion? I think uh, from one side, you cannot be too detailed because exactly then you have a problem with um, getting the responses, but also like in ideal world before you get uh, a party that is processing data, you have a GDPR uh, and security checklist, which is even like more detailed than asking uh, some maybe high level question, like what is the architecture where data, data is stored? But I think that also brings uh, to the point that I mentioned earlier, that exactly we in the procurement, having our values reflected because just focusing on the technical price and other criteria is not enough and it's not leading us uh, in the direction that we want to go. So, and just on the point of uh, international transfers, I think there is improvement because just uh, this week there was this huge fine uh, imposed on Meta. So I think that will uh, also lead a new direction in the international transfers. Okay. Mm. Great. So any, well, we maybe talk later a little bit on the other things. So all of these, we, yeah. We would, I just had a question. Yeah, you please um, use the microphone for the again. Yes. Um, I wondered whether you see a trend, or whether you see like successful projects where um, publicly, like for universities or also schools, for example, uh, build their own software and their own technical infrastructure successfully? Because I think that I know about a few projects in Germany at, uh, at schools where they, for example, started to build their own learning platform simply because they were not, I don't know, happy with the, not sure with the values, but more of the transparency provided by, um, yeah, industry partners. They simply, I think they couldn't ensure that yeah. <laughs> the transparent or the values were, um, yeah. I'm not sure, but universities themselves, but I think, Jeon, uh, for example, I think they did also yes. some work on that, right? So, so in Jeon project, we have uh, several um, initi initiatives that were focused on like European-based um, solutions. And for example, um, we have Edurom that is uh, widely known and a huge success. And we have also Edumit that is an um, alternative to video conferencing platforms on the other continents. But I think we had also um, the problem with those uh, local initiatives is that we don't have such a advertising budgets and uh, advertising expertise as our um, American opponents. I think uh, that's the biggest problem because uh, really advertising is a huge part of selling. And even though we are a community of a national research education networks and we have a lot of people involved, I still, I think we are still struggling to get um, our solution to be noticed. And I think we are a huge community. Thank you. Okay, maybe to, to change the final 15 minutes or so of this, maybe to uh, like to, uh, to, to, to discuss some of you, with you, some of the values, right? So we are here from the, uh, uh, privacy conference, so the GDPR and, 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 and privacy protection is, of course, one of the important European values, but related especially when it comes to academic freedom slash a kind of solution like open source software. So what kind of values are then important to keep in mind so we can guide the, the, the academia uh, uh, further, in, in uh, well, especially in Europe, and maybe, uh, so I, I will ask each of you this kind of question, and maybe you can also think of how you, Europe, what is the, then the difference between Europe and, for example, Asia of America? Because then, what are we Europeans? Maybe Oscar, you can start. Yeah, so I, um, um, I approach this discussion from looking into different uh, conceptualizations of privacy and data protection, which are often being used you know, as synonyms, but they are not. They're actually two different things. Um, and there's more. Uh, that is very interesting. And actually, when you look into uh, what is around in, in the scientific and academic environment, you see that there's quite a lot of new things happening, which are also sometimes being taken up by private companies. So, for instance, differential privacy, where you are looking at statistics, but they are just interested in the trends and artificially more or less 
fake the data so that the individual data points are not working anymore and there's contextual integrity and so on. And I think when it comes or when writing about data autonomy and when doing uh, the conceptual thinking behind it, I used uh, the, this concept, which is a fundamental right originally coming from Germany, which is called informational self-determination. It's from the 1980s. The idea is that um, as a citizen, you are not, you don't have to be afraid of what the state knows about you. And the, what I really like about it is that in contrast to, for instance, data protection, it is very clear what it is trying to protect because it is based on two things. One is the protection of and the promotion of human dignity. And the other thing is the um, uh, possibility to develop your personality, which is increasingly being challenged by datafication because, as I mentioned before, everything is being projected. Everything is being uh, predicted on, on in terms of what is going likely to happen. So this ability to float as a person and to develop really starts to disappear. But of course, information and self-determination is coming from the 1980s, so the world was looking very different, and so we need to expand it, and that's where data autonomy comes in. And then we expand it, and that's the interesting thing in an academic environment, because when you look at academic freedom, academic freedom is a specialized uh, version as a right of the freedom of expression, um, but it has both an individual capacity, so academics need to speak need to be able to speak freely as individuals, but also institutions need to be able to provide an environment where they can do so. So you also have that this link between the individual and the community. So that is what we need to add to information and self-determination when we talk about data autonomy. But there is then also, so this is one element. The second element is the private players play a much bigger role. So it's not only about the relationship between the citizen and the state, but also, you know, these very powerful private players. And the third and last bit is that it's not only about the data which is being stored in databases, it's also a common criticism on data protection. You know, it's very much focused on the 70s thinking, uh, but that it's also about the uh, potential use of data uh, for making predictions. Mm -hmm. and, and so in a nutshell, it's still about, you know, protecting human dignity. It's still about um, uh, trying to give this potential to develop as a person, and then I would add as a community, yeah. but expand it with these three characters. Yeah, yeah. And, and finally, so it's short, the difference between Europe and, and Americas, Africa, Asia? Well, there are commonalities in the sense that, you know, human dignity is central in terms of human rights law in general, but then the question is also which type of priority do you give that? And it's different in the sense that I think when it comes to particularly this potential for the development uh, in, in, um, of individuals, then probably you would have uh, different types of prioritization there in other regions of the world. Okay, but maybe uh, mom, uh, I have some thoughts on that, but before I go, maybe Mando first. Uh, yeah. So the, uh, the European values. rights value, the European values, and how does it relate to academic, academia or academic freedom? Yeah. Um, following up on Oscar's um, um, comments, for me, um, a very big value that we should be discussing right now is the concept of agency, an individual agency. So uh, Oscar already discussed it and we can already see that, yes, what data protection and the GDP are giving us is the premise of consent. And that's huge and not to be underestimated. But we already see that consent is a very poor proxy for what we really need. And consent many times really uh, disappoint us. So, uh, in the an era of data analytics, uh, and when we're discussing academic freedom and developing one's personality, uh, for me, and that's interesting, we start to have issues regarding uh, something that we have taken for granted from a human rights law perspective so far freedom of thought. Freedom of thought, which is a, a separate uh, human right, it has to do with, it's internalized, it's not externalized like freedom of expression, right? And it has to do with how we form our thinking. And that's really, really important. Um, consent, uh, very important, but for me it's agency. The agency that we're able to give to individuals regarding choices that they're making. And that's why I think the link with technologies is very, very important. Uh, now, um, in terms of European, non-European, uh, I'm a, a huge uh, a proponent of open source, precisely of the choices that it gives. Um, 
but I wouldn't necessarily only put it in terms of European, non-European, because you may even have a European vendor that is open source and at the same time may not respect all the values that we want them to respect, right? Uh, so it's not just about open source, it's about respecting very specific uh, values, th this values that we would like to aspire to. Uh, yeah, that's it for now. Okay. Agency. It's a freedom of thought. And freedom of thought. And then not be influenced by yeah. what's going on there. Yeah. Thanks. Frank, so what's your idea on, on European values? Yeah, I mean, the obvious answers were already mentioned. Um, freedom of expression, uh, privacy, um, self-determination of um, my, in, my, own, my own data. I don't need to repeat that. I want to bring one aspect into it, which is, um, yeah, maybe a bit unusual, but maybe from a, from a, from a technical perspective, which is the, how, how important it is to actually understand the technology and what's going on. So, because we have to understand that if we move to a future where like, I don't know, four or five big tech companies um, provide all the IT, computer, cloud services to us. And we are no longer, we are only customers, basically. Then, then we also lose a lot in, in Europe here because we're not able to understand the technology anymore. There's another important thing of open, open source. It's not only the transparency and you can host it wherever you want. It's also to look into it. It's one of the fundamental principles from Richard Stallman, like from the 80s, that you have the right to study the code. You have the right to look into it and how it works. And you can then improve and learn also for, for, um, uh, for, for, uh, yeah, for training, for, for yeah, for students basically to understand how this all works and then you can improve on top of it and you can build on it. So, um, standing on the shoulders of giants is, is the term here. Just imagine if this would not be the case. Then it's a little bit like we in Europe, we, we receive all the, the, the meals, all the food from another continent and we totally forget how to cook here. Right. This is the similar thing here. I think we, it's very important that we still understand how to cook and we still understand how to write software and how to, to do it because only then we are in, in control in the future. Yeah, a very, very valid point, especially in academia, because some of the uh, at universities, they, 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 they're working on providing code as well, right? So in the computer science department, for example. So I think this is very relevant uh, thought. So, Madeleine, so European values? I think I would add uh, to what have been said already, right to be left alone. Because really with the development of AI and how the predictions algorithms will, will work and basically um, follow our each step and even they will uh, predict our thoughts is a, a, li a little bit scary and also uh, with what is happening already on the market. I mean, uh, Clearview AI is a company that uh, used um, uh, publicly uh, available pictures, changed those pictures into sensitive data, into biometric data, put them into their database of uh, facial recognition. And now they are fine in already in Italy, France and uh, Greece. But still, I think um, we need to have this freedom of mind that Suddenly, if we have, even if we have on Facebook a pro public profile, we will not end up in some uh, facial recognition system without being even informed, not even ask for our consent. So I think the future is, um, is, is challenging and will, I think, for the future, even data autonomy is even more important than it was yesterday. Yeah. And about this European versus Europe part of the world? Well, I think... In Europe, we are in a very privileged place. Uh, we have a very diverse culture, but I think our values, I think we are not fighting with famine anymore. I, I, there are definitely some less privileged areas. But in Africa, there is huge, um, of course, uh, cultural di diversity, and they have like different kind of problems. And I think in America, they have a little bit uh, like the freedom itself is like the biggest value, even though I think in Europe we have this uh, common, like uh, there, is, uh, there is value in being together and having common values. So I think that may be, and privacy is important and I hope it will be even more important. Great. Wow. Please use the microphone to 
Me. So, um, my question is also related to values and uh, um, efficiency is also something that we might want to take into account because uh, these are all uh, very uh, nice principles from a human rights perspective, but uh, my experience of using uh, video um, platforms during the pandemic shows that uh, many times the open source ones, the ones that are in development were not the most efficient ones and we had the breaks and we had the camera not working. So how do you think we should look at this trade-off between um, uh, solutions that are more, uh, let's say, uh, human rights uh, or affirming the values and uh, human rights framework versus uh, efficiency. I guess that uh, moving towards uh, open source might also be a threat to security. So I was wondering how you see this uh, value at stake. Uh, so yeah, that's my uh, very good questions. Question. Uh, maybe Frank is, we can have some answers for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't say that everybody should go to the next class. <laughs> <laughs> everybody should, but no, I don't think that. Um, I don't think it it is a tra it, it should be it should not be a trade off, and it doesn't absolutely it doesn't has to be a trade off between usability and and privacy and security and open source, and uh, not at all. I, I actually think this is really disconnected. Um, really good software can be very make you very productive, can be very efficient, easy to use, and this doesn't matter if it's like coming from the US cloud or if it's locally hosted open source software. Um, the reason why open source tools are often not as good is because there is not enough funding into it. There's not a lot of people using it. There's not a lot of, yeah. I mean, we've mixed a lot up, I don't know, 0.1% of the size of Microsoft, right? And this is then just limitations of manpower. But this has nothing to do with following certain values or, or rights about that. So it's absolutely possible. Yeah, um, but maybe yeah. to, to dip, dip a little bit, dip, uh, dive a little bit deeper in this one. Yeah. So you, if there is the situation uh, that, 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 that the big tech, you know, have thousands of people and, and Mexico is not a small company, it's uh, only 1%, and let alone the other open source yeah. uh, 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 companies, so how can we then overcome this current situation that yeah. was described? You that's, know, that's also my experience sometimes, you know. Yeah, there's an answer for it. Um, and the answer is um, open source is not only that the software is free and available, and open source is also a development model. Open source is a way that a lot of people from different organizations can collaborate together based on the same standards. This is like how the Linux kernel is built. This is how like, I don't know, MySQL, Firefox and so on is built. This is also totally in sync with the way academic works, where you can also build on top of the, in the, the results from other people. And this is like also the open source model. So we as a, as a company, we are around 100 people, but we actually have 2000 volunteers on the internet who help to write the software. And it's not only, this is actually even more with all the translations and the plugins and everything. And the, the way to overcome that is that we collaborate more. That, that all the universities, all the volunteers on the internet, all kinds of organizations collaborate together on, on one piece of software. And then together we are stronger than these uh, big tech companies. So I think this is a way to overcome it. Yeah, so I, I fully agree, but I would really like to add that come back to the procurement discussion before that that to do this you need a change in mindset in in academia or in, in higher uh, higher higher education institutions, and that so the boards of uh, and, and, and and board members should realize that they should invest in setting up these kind of communities rather than invest in in in, in procuring you know the the big tech things. So that's also a role that is uh, uh, well. The, the, which results in the current situation that you know all the university Netherlands use Microsoft except one, and and you know uh, in other countries they also use all those kind of things. You want to say something about that? Yeah. Yes, um, I think this is an excellent point because uh, there is an efficiency, cost, of course, right? Um, they are very valid. Um, not necessarily, I agree, a trade-off, but it is part of of, of, a, of an equation. Um, let's start with security, uh, just to be crystal clear, because that's an easy one with security. Uh, and in light of very recent um, uh, incidents uh, with vulnerabilities, 
uh, the last uh, few years. We have right now both uh, the US leadership, uh, the president of the US and EU, saying that open source and having open source software is actually an issue of national security priority. So they embrace now the concept that open source is actually much more secure. So that, that box, we can now tick it. It's really good. Uh, in terms of um, uh, efficiency and cost, uh, yes, for the specific technologies to take off, we need market adoption, right, in general. Uh, and that's a huge discussion there. Uh, I would expect, uh, and a very good example is what happened uh, a few years back in France and with the Health Data Hub, um, because the French government at the beginning was saying for the Health Data Hub, we're going to use some of the French uh, vendors, but they went, uh, the French government went for Amazon and uh, Microsoft and Google. And uh, right now, well, there was, uh, they even went to court, I think. No, I had, they did. And uh, there was a huge policy conversation because the European vendors really complained to the French government, why are you not using us? Because you're saying that you want to prioritize us and our values, right? Uh, so I would expect, and I think that we do need it when it comes to the public sector and when we're discussing public values, I would expect the state to provide certain funding so that certain, perhaps smaller uh, and of a smaller capacity, open source solutions to be funded and to be developed and to be brought to a level that can compete uh, with uh, non-European ones and they can offer what we want them to offer. I think this is very important. We need this funding. Yeah. And it links to, the, as you said before, the narrative, right? That big tech is doing everything. And there's also in that narrative that big tech will never fail. And it's always secure, which is, of course, not the reality, but they tell it. What's your, your experience in this, the, the, about the security and efficiency of open source? I think, uh, exactly, uh, open source requires a little bit, maybe, more of effort. And I think uh, also the, the apps that were developed by different countries for tracking corona were a good example how just uh, joining forces and building one open source application would be a solution, better solution. But I think when it comes to the security, it can be secure. And I think I have very good example in mind. A Dutch government uh, made open source its uh, DGID, which is a um, like application used to verify your identity for all the online services connected with your identity in the in the internet. So it can be secure, but I think it must be just a important part of the de development process. Yeah, maybe yeah. Oscar. Yeah, yeah, I would I would just like to add to that that. Um, if you take a step back and also actually even starting to work and think about this and looking just at the Netherlands, you know, there are like 13 or 14 traditional universities and all of them use Microsoft and we are as a university only one who uses Google. Um, then if you apply that, you know, make it bigger a little bit and look at applied, uh, um, University of Applied Sciences and so on, the picture is the same. So it, we're really now in a situation that if we continue to go down this path, there are maximum two choices. So either you're the one or the other. And what is really concerning about it, that all of these tools, the fundamental decisions about how is research being done, how is teaching being done, how are all of these things being done, they are not more anymore going to be made by academics. And I think academia here is just a very useful proxy for what is happening overall in society. So in the, in the short term, I mean, I know this sounds like when we talk here, it, it sounds like very radical. And if we really go through with this, then, you know, the, everything needs to change, which maybe needs to. But it's first, like in the next months, in the next year, it's about increasing the number of choices. And therefore, it's really, really important to look at the alternative. There are alternatives, raise awareness around these alternatives, and then really properly scrutinize them and see what happens if we go and run with them and do something with them. And then we can see what the potential is, et cetera. But it's really, really important when starting this discussion and then talking about cost and efficiency and all of this, that we already went so far down this route of improving efficiency and reducing cost that essentially we lost all of our agency in this game. And that is something which is just not acceptable. 
Well, if these nice were already passed uh, the, 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 the 10 o'clock uh, uh, milestone today, so uh, coffee is waiting. So I think these, we are not finished with the, uh, with the discussions, but I think we need a, a, a very good uh, discussion this morning. So thank for the panel, Oscar Armando, Frank Magdalena, and of course the audience. Yeah. Thanks so much for uh, doing, uh, being involved in this workshop of things, and, uh, and uh, hopefully we, uh, we can keep on this discussion going with uh, the, the more academic freedom with the use of the uh, good digital tools. Thanks so much.